Colorado tried to become a state several times, but the Confederates or Confederate sympathizers had stopped it. So that means the Confederacy is the antithesis of the state of Colorado. They're the antithesis, which is a great, good thing. They fought against the United States in defense of slavery, right? Fuck them. And so the Confederates and their sympathizers made the struggle of getting Colorado to statehood ridiculously hard. This is the history of that. So 1864, one year before the end of the Civil War, the first Constitutional Convention approves Colorado's first proposed constitution, but the Colorado people rejected it by a vote of 1,500 to 4,600, 4,672. So by 3,000 votes. So that was just the Colorado people. The next year, 1865, the second Colorado Constitutional Convention adopts a second the second Constitution of Colorado was adopted again in 1875. The Constitutional Convention adopted it. And this time, the voters approved it, okay? So now we had a successful co Constitutional Convention in which the voters approved of it. But Andrew Johnson, the shittiest U.S. president ever, however, refused to adopt Colorado into the United States nation. So Andrew Johnson fucked over Reconstruction. Andrew Johnson was a Confederate sympathizer. He, uh, they talked about hanging Jefferson Davis. He said, no, we should hang Thaddeus Stevens or one of the other radical Republicans. And so the radical Republicans, there was a bright, shining moment there right after the Civil War was over with the Freedom Schools, with the, uh, with the black schools, with the Freedmen's Bureau, with the, but it was an occupation, right? It was a military occupation of the so once Andrew Johnson gets in there, he goes ahead and forgives all the Confederates, and then they just start reelecting them all the time, and then it's no time. Because of Andrew Johnson, Reconstruction fails, and then the military occupation is over, and then we'll have segregation for 100 years. We could have had this race situation solved, but Andrew Johnson, he fucking fought hard, and he was like, no, hell no. We're going to fight, you know, the, he's going to take the racist banner, which sucks because he was the running mate of Abraham Lincoln, but John Wilkes Booth, upon assassinating the president, actually wind up getting a small victory for the South by taking up the chief executive and then putting up a Confederate sympathizer. So in 1866, the U.S. Congress approves a Colorado statehood bill, but Andrew Dickhold Johnson vetoes it. So you got the people of Colorado. you got a constitutional convention of Colorado. They've already got their constitution. They're ready to become an American state, but in 1865, 1866, Andrew Johnson. Then again, U.S. Congress approves a second Colorado statehood bill, but President Bitchface Johnson vetoes it again. So in 1865, he blocked the statehood of Colorado. In 1866, 1867, Andrew Dickhold Johnson vetoes the Colorado statehood bill of U.S. Congress. In 1869, Ulysses S. Grant becomes the 18th president of the United States, which gives hope to the Colorado statehood hopefuls, but Congress fails to pass a third Colorado statehood bill. Two years later, 1871, the U.S. Congress again fails to pass a fourth Colorado statehood bill again. So the people wanted it, the voters wanted it, Andrew Johnson stopped it, now it's getting hard as fuck in order to do it. Is Colorado even going to become a state? Is Colorado even going to become a state now because of Andrew Johnson? In 1873, a big panic of 1873, the Great Panic or Great Depression, Congress once again fails to pass a fifth proposed Colorado statehood bill. So another Great Depression on top of the Great Depression. In his fifth annual message to Congress in 1873, U.S. Grant endorses a second enabling act for the state of Colorado. So we're still doing state bills in U.S. Congress, and we're still not getting anywhere. In 1875, the Second Enabling Act for the State of Colorado is enacted by Congress, signed into law by Ulysses S. Grant. Colorado voters elect delegates to the Third Colorado Constitutional Convention. Uh-oh, it looks like something actually might happen now. So 1875. In the beginning, it started in 1864. That one got voted down, but then 1865, the second Constitutional Convention had passed it. So since 1865, Colorado had been trying to become a state. So in 
took about 10 years, 10 years in order to finally get the second Enabling Act for the state of Colorado passed by Congress, signed into law by the president, and now Colorado voters elected delegates to the third Colorado Constitutional Convention. Not a commission, a commission. <laughs> it's a convention, a constitutional convention. They're writing the Constitution of Colorado, and this would be the third one. The second one passed, the first one didn't. The second one was in 1865. It's now 1875. 1876, the third Colorado Constitutional Convention in Denver adopts the third constitution of the state of Colorado. This state constitution, which is our current state constitution, was inspired by the third constitution of the state of Illinois, drafted in 1870, the fourth constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, drafted in 1873, and the third constitution of the state of Missouri, drafted in 1875. The Colorado Congress of State Constitutions of the United States. So Colorado's constitution is one of the longest state constitutions out there. On July 1st, 1876, by a vote of 15,443 to 4,039, overwhelming majority, over 75%, right? That's uh, by a huge margin. Three out of four people voted in favor of the third proposed constitution of the state of Colorado. On July 1st, they voted it. And then on August 1st, 1876, President U.S. Grant proclaims that the territory of Colorado has now been accepted into the Union as the state of Colorado, the 38th American state, the centennial state. And that's how Colorado was born. So it took 11 more years on top of when voters wanted the second constitution. What was the second constitution? What would have been the laws and the makeup of then? We would have started. Because of these low-life pieces of shit, fucking Confederates, these racist fucking slave, you know, they're... The most of the whites were drafted into it. Eighty percent, you know, they might have owned one black or so. But in terms of the one percent and the ninety-nine percent, the ninety-nine percent was being drafted so the one percent could own these plantations. So this is incredible. This is ridiculous. People are still sympathetic to a thousand slave owners in the 1850s. This is ridiculous. Fuck the Confederates. Not only are they terrorists and treasonous, they're racist as shit. It's not even funny. They're also the enemy of America. I feel as an American, and I'm not even that big into nationalism, but as an American, I, am, I hate the Confederates. Fuck the Confederacy. And fuck the Nazis, you know? So the Confederacy is the antithesis of Colorado. The way they fought tooth and nail to stop Colorado from becoming a state, fuck the Confederacy. In 1923, there was a horrible, vicious race riot, and it was a Rosewood massacre in Florida. Since the Las Vegas shooting, people are saying he's, you know, the number one shooter of all time, but it's not the number one mass killing of all time, not even close. Gettysburg was way worse. Rosewood was also worse. So 59 people got shot in Las Vegas, and one got shot and killed in Las Vegas, but it was 150 people that got killed in Rosewood. More people got killed in Rosewood than what got caught in Las, uh, got killed in Las Vegas. So Rosewood, the 1923 race riot, the Rosewood massacre was a worse mass killing than in Las Vegas, but most Americans don't even know about Rosewood. Singleton is the director, so John Singleton is the same director who directed Boys in the Hood. So he directed Boys in the Hood, he directed Rosewood, this was in 1997. It wasn't a commercial success and it wasn't able to recoup its $30 million budget at the box office. Don Cheadle is Sylvester Carrier and John Voigt is, I can't stand John Voigt's character the whole way through. He is unlikable all the way through. Dan Sarah, who's working as a housekeeper for James Taylor and his wife, Fanny. Fanny Taylor. So this is a white couple who lives on the white side of town in Sumter. So Sumter is the white part of town. You got Fanny Taylor. And Fanny Taylor is cheating on, his, on, her, wife, or on her husband. So Fanny Taylor 
is having sex outside of marriage, right? So, oh, she's a sinner. And then when she's uh, having sex with her lover, she gets into an argument with her lover, and then he attacks her, and he hits her, and she gets a black guy. Now, because she's got a black eye, her husband's going to come home, and then he's going to ask questions. She's going to have to fess up. Instead of fessing up, instead of telling the truth, instead of being a good, honest, pure, white woman, angelic creature that James Taylor pretends Fanny to be, instead she comes up with a lie. And she says that she wasn't beat up by her lover instead. She says that she was raped by a black man, and then she changes her story, and she says she just beat by a black man, but definitely a black man, and she didn't use that word. Uh, she didn't say black either. So she gets into a hysteria and she's crying and she's like, oh my God, this person did the same to me. So because of a false rape accusation, the Rosewood Massacre happens. So because she said she was attacked by a black man, the KKK in Sumner and the white racist and other people in neighboring towns go into Rosewood in order to investigate. Eventually they find one person, somebody did something, they kill one, they kill two, they kill the maid, they kill the Aunt Sarah, and then it's on. It's on. It's a fucking race riot. And that's essentially this white mob goes around killing black people willy-nilly. 150 people. Fifty people were killed in Rosewood. 150 people is greater than 59. So I'm not going to try to sit there and make that one guy look like he's something. This is important to understand, too, because it shows the power of a white woman. The, a white woman lied. She made up a falsehood. And based upon that falsehood of alleged rape, the entire town got massacred. The reason why we know about Rosewood today is because the children ran off into the woods and into the alligator swamps in order to get away from the white lynch mobs. And then eventually some of them got on a train and went to some other city. The other ones just kept running. They never talked about it for 50 years, afraid that their perpetrators might catch up with them. But then in their late age, they eventually came out and started talking about this. 150 people were killed in Rose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop that. Oh, my God. Hey, wait. My God. Hey, you want to go? 
300 was called question 301 last year so it says it's crime prevention and reduction they're doing a quarter cent city sales tax imposed on the city for 10 years same thing right 3.6 million dollars over 10 years that's 36 million dollars we could have solved homelessness with that kind of money but instead we're just going to throw it into the police it anticipates using the tax for prevention early intervention and outreach services targeting at-risk youth so there, we're still targeting the at-risk youth. This one was based upon the Oakland model, still vote, you know, based on the Oakland model. And then it says that the city municipal code, marijuana code, be amended by the new chapter 15 section, subject to annual performance of financial audits. So is this an anti-marijuana thing? I remember the author was very particular about not wanting it to be associated with marijuana whatsoever. To question number 301 was oversight by a city's uh, group places another layer of management on the city. It's not clear how these citizens would be chosen, how they would serve, or whether or how they would be compensated. There's widely different opinions regarding how to perform outreach prevention, early intervention in order to reduce crime. There's already entities in Pueblo who works on these services or provides these services. It's not clear which community-based programs they want to increase. Many of these programs are private and privately funded. Would this money then go to private programs? Who would determine which private programs would receive the city money? And this was failed. This was voted down by 55 to 45 percent last year. It was 46 or 47,000 votes total. 26 said no. 21,000 said yes. So it lost by about 5,000 votes. Ten points. <laughs> My boy don't know nothing about this business. You let him tell that. Let's guess it. How to tell us something. I know y'all. I was meet once more than that, but I was a young man. 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 With Miss I've seen the man's face as plain as day, and most of you men know that that man was white. Nobody Free speech through the act of petitioning is a cornerstone of American democracy. It's the First Amendment. We have a right to speech, assembly, right to petition, right to do five different freedoms, right? The First Amendment, that's our first freedom, the first guarantees of our rights. And Meyer v. Grant, 1988, guarantees that we have a free speech through the act of petitioning. Petitioning is one form of speech, and that we're able to petition in public spaces even if it's owned by a private entity. For example, in Marsh v. Alabama, 1946, the court found that the right to free speech could not be denied in public areas of a company-owned town, which established a precedent of pro private public access pro property. So private public access property. So those private things, gro like grocery stores, right? Grocery stores are privately owned, but the public... Tell me right now. I told you no more, too. Did I tell you that? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. To going around gathering signatures, I think that there is an etiquette and that there should be some, that there should be standards. Now, I went around gathering signatures and I was always respectful of people. I would get three no's and then I would just quit pestering them. It seemed like if I went past three no's, 
it's hard to say no anyways. And if somebody was like, no, th no, thank no, thank you. And uh, then I would just let go. You know, I'm not going to just sit there and harass somebody until they do what I want them to do. Three no's is hard to, you know, uh, sort of get by anyways. Some people would get frustrated with that, but it seemed, it felt fair to me. So when it comes to where you can petition and where you can't petition, Colorado has a very active petitioning uh, culture. And so I think it's important to understand this for everybody to be on the same page. So when it comes to public spaces, there's no question whatsoever. If you're respectful and professional, you can be at the post office, you can be at the library, you can be on sidewalks, you could go door to door. You know, that's actually door to door is a. about the public spots, purely public, right? So sidewalks is purely public. The street is purely public. Parks are purely public. So public streets, sidewalks, bus stops, post office, libraries, these government buildings, right? So these are all clearly public entities of which petitioning can happen. Somebody can come up to you and say, hey, will you sign a petition? And then you could say, you know, to hell with you. I'd never sign a petition, and I'm embarrassed. I'm pissed off that you even asked. Or, you know, just no thank you would be probably the best way to say no if you don't want to do it. But why not listen and hear what they're talking about? And if you agree with it, you know, uh, add your support. All they're looking for is a name on a piece of paper, for shit's sake, God. So the uh, building on that decision, Marsh v. Alabama, they came up with, traditional public forums, the streets, sidewalks, and the parks, but then they also pointed out that shopping center park and Supreme Court case Bach versus West Minster Mall Company, 1991, says that shopping center parking lots are acceptable to gather petition signatures. And I think that's actually really important. Everybody has to eat. Everybody do, does have to go to the grocery store. So to be banned from the grocery store is, a, you know, basically being banned from eating. Now, you can't just accept any kind of, you know, behavior no matter what, especially criminal behavior. So, you know, you can't just let anybody and everybody to go into this place. But there is, you know, you got to be, you can't go around like attacking people, right? So grocery stores can uh, ban people from coming to them, but the people still need to eat. So how are they going to eat? You know, there's got to be a sort of uh, middle ground. And so that's what we're essentially saying is that there's a balance here. So a grocery store is a public place that a lot of people go to. And if you stay respectful, it doesn't seem, you know, would you like to sign this petition According to Bach versus Westminster Mall Company. In Headline of the Pueblo Chieftain, there's 60 pounds of heroin seized, five people were indicted, and so you got all the guns and all the weapons and all the drugs and the money, and while part of me is excited, right, these are the big guys, right, these aren't just the petty, just the people on the, this is the people that are supplying all the heroin to a lot of people. Now, this would, you know, this makes Charlotte Perez happy, this makes most of, uh, the candidates happy, they are okay with this kind of behavior. Now, it's, uh, I, let me tell you what I think about it, okay? So, essentially, this is the war on drugs. So, the war on drugs, the whole point that the war on drugs began was to go after the blacks and to go after the activists. That was the whole point. That's why Nixon made sure that marijuana was on, you know, Schedule One substance. 
and that is against federal law. So the war on drugs was made to go after the activists and the black. They also got some meth and they also got some cocaine. So this was a huge drug bust, right? Lots of drugs. Just like how we have lots of drugs at Walmart and lots of drugs at the pharmacy, lots of drugs at Walgreens, lots of drugs everywhere. In fact, if you sold a shit ton of drugs of Oxycontin, well then you're, you know, you're going to be making bank as CEO. You're going to be making your stockholders happy. So it depends on, you know, what kind of drugs you're selling and where you're selling and what kind of person, right? Some people can sell a shit ton of drugs and make shit tons of money, and other people cannot. Now, the ultimate, the big thing is, you know, people are going to say, well, look at all this danger, all those weapons, all those guns. Well, it's, it's illegal. The whole point of them making money was because it was illegal. Since it's illegal, they can make a shit ton of money. What do you think happened to the heroin prices just now? Heroin prices are going through the roof. So is somebody going to pick up the slack? You think we're going to get rid of all the drugs or all the heroin? Has it been eliminated? Flores would be happy, so a lot of people would be happy with this heroin, you know, bust. And a part of me is happy about it, right? These are like some big guys that were taken out. But because the war on drugs is being implemented, it makes them profitable. That gives them the incentive to go out and do this. So that's what the war on drugs is doing. We're not going to get rid of the heroin. You think because we just got rid of all this meth and cocaine and heroin, you think it's off our streets now? You, you think that Pueblo will never see another drop of heroin or meth or anything else? Bullshit. That's bullshit. The drugs haven't been gotten rid of. The war on drugs is a failure. They can get away with this shit for maybe one or two more years. But the direction that we need to go is decriminalization and treatment. These people have problems. They got issues. And to make it decriminalize, to legalize it, that puts all this black market money out of business. It's legal now, so now they can't, you know, make a shit ton of money off of illegal stuff. Right. You crying on that? You ain't a little boy no more. You're a man. Are you feeling tears in these eyes? I need you to be strong. You're not a lieutenant, understand? Yes, now you gather up these women and children. You don't move deep into the storm. It's still illegal. There's going to be somebody else that's going to take, you know, their spot. There's still going to be heroin. There's still going to be meth. There's still going to be cocaine. And even if you're to take away all the hard stuff, even if to take away marijuana, you still got alcohol, right? You can always just go get some beer and get trashed. And if somebody is homeless and they're getting drunk all the time, that's a public health crisis. And that's what Switzerland is doing. So while we're all sitting there back patting and we're spending all this money to go after the heroin, good bust, you know, uh, give accolades where accolades is due. So good job on Troy Davenport. But he's not gonna, we're not going to get rid of the heroin. We're not going to get rid of all the problems associated with heroin. What Switzerland is doing is they're working to reduce the harm. We're not reducing the harm. We're not reducing the harm. So in Sw Switzerland, they actually have a medical professional in these clinics where people can inject themselves. So they're not spreading HIV and diseases and all this other shit. Reduce the harm. We're not reducing the harm. So when we have an STD outbreak, an HIV outbreak around here, you'll know why. some of the problems that heroin junkies bring into a neighborhood, right? They get addicted on this shit and they just want to rob and steal. So we need to get those folks out of those neighborhoods. We need to get those folks in some sort of facility, some sort of house away from, you know, the good people, the people that aren't drug addled and homeless. Since they're homeless, they also need a home. But first, right, get them off to the side. You don't want these, you know, druggy uh, people you know, harming folks. So get them off to the side. Get them in a house. 
Now we need to reduce the harm. Now we need to reduce, now we give a shit about them, right? Give a shit about the 90, 95% of the public. And then once they've been pushed off to the side, we're going to have to reintroduce them back into our society. We're not going to get rid of people. We're not going to get rid of people. So come one, come all, and then every person, there's a place for you in Pueblo. So we'll get you in a house. We'll get you a job. We'll get you cleaned up. And, you know, as long as if the homeless have a fighting chance, then I can uh, stop giving a crap about them. But they don't have a chance. People that are principally against the war on drugs who believe in personal freedom is Josh Bruns and Michael Stapleton. They all they say think that you know we have a right as Americans to do what we want to our own bodies. And everywhere the war on drugs has been implemented has been a failure. Everywhere it is. Uh, the alternatives have been implemented. It succeeded. So we got about a dozen, right? Switzerland, Portugal, Colorado. Look at our legalization of marijuana. So it's working. It is working. And so this is our focus. Our focus should be reducing the harm, reducing the harm. You don't want the needles strewn about. You don't want people getting stuck on the needles. They're homeless. They're desperate, just like a drunken homeless person. They're not really, you know, Otis. You just put them in jail, you know, the drunk tank overnight, and then you, you know, cooked them breakfast. Aunt B cooked them breakfast. So that's what we're doing. We're taking all these Otises and we're ruining their lives. And as much as I like to clean the streets up, they're human beings. They're people. Question 300 and the best case scenario. The best case scenario of question 300 is that we're going to have these 10 neighborhood districts. They are going to have power over the cops, which they absolutely will not. The author said that is not the intent whatsoever. So they don't believe in civilian oversight. The author doesn't believe in civilian oversight. The author hates marijuana. The author is against everything and anything that's liberal. Her progressiveness is for big business, so that's fascism. So this fascist just wants to increase the fascist. So, okay, I, I don't think that this is a good bill. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt because I hope for the best, but I expect the worst. So I hope for the best. So, okay, let's say this is an altruistic thing. This is just to help the community out. We're going to have in all the 10 neighborhood districts, we're going to have gymnasiums. We're going to have music, and we're going to have arts. You know, we're going to have these gangster kids just painting, you know, little finger paintings, and they're going to be doing some, you know, flutes, playing a Legitimately, my favorite parts to the thing. So if there was gymna gymnasiums, and in those gymnasiums, we actually put most of the $36 million into it, not personnel, not health care, not, you know, a bunch of uh, just uh, increase in a fascism, but we're actually giving out opportunities here. We're not just targeting the Hispanic youth. This is based on an Oakland model. Hold on, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so hope for the best. We're, let's, we're hoping for the best here. So in all 10 neighborhoods, we're going to have a gymnasium, and we're going to have music and arts, and all these, you know, would-be gangsters are going to get into these gymnasiums. They're going to play these, you know, do these finger paintings and get into these, you know, recorder playing uh, hot cross buns, and this is going to solve everything. I think gymnasiums would be wonderful. I think rec centers would be great. I think if we actually get them into arts and music, that would be wonderful. I think maybe we should get into, like, hip-hop and maybe some Picasso, you know, hire the expectations they'll meet your expectations so i think this could be a
case scenario that we actually get 10 recreation centers, 10 gymnasiums that is owned by the city of Pueblo, by these grants and these grant writing committees. So we're able to get all these gymnasiums all over the place in 10 different locations in each and every ward. And so we're not just having people, you know, go all around. We're actually building ourselves. Our, and it's health, right? Recreation center, arts, music. This is all good stuff. That's best case scenario. What's going to happen is the arts and the music and the gymnasiums will not appear. We will not see any of these capital improvement structures. We, you will see very few love and compassion and empathy. This is an increase of fascism. This is a very right-wing, hard right-wing conservative. Conservative, conservative, conservative. The author pretends that this is a progressive town, but this bill was very important for her that it's conservative. It must be conservative. So what does that mean? No marijuana, we're going to have a bunch of war on drugs, Nixonian right-wingers, you know, attacking. the best, but I'm going to expect the worst. And the worst is, you know, a massacre, a nuclear holocaust. Like, what's worse than terrorism? War, right? We use war to go after terrorism. What do you do to stop war? I guess nuclear holocaust. What's worse than nuclear holocaust? Like some sort of planet collision, something that knocks Earth out of the solar system, some sort of, you know, cosmo, uh, cosmopolitan, not cosmopolitan, kind of the cosmos, right? Something in the universe that's completely beyond our control, right? So the worst case scenario is a nuclear holocaust. I'll go ahead and say, no, it's not going to be a nuclear holocaust. It's not going to hit Earth off of its orbit, though, because it targets Hispanics, because it targets uh, the at-risk youth, because it's based on the Oakland model. Oakland is the black people, so there's 2% black here in Pueblo, 44% Hispanic. They're not, there's no blacks here to target. They're targeting the Hispanics. They're targeting... That wasn't the case, but talking to the author of 300, the, the, she feels as though she can't criticize anybody that has a Hispanic last name. It actually reminds me of this Palestinian Israel video where this Israeli girl was attacking this Palestinian boy, and uh, they were like, um, the Israeli people, the racist Israelis, were putting it in the girl's hand, and he's like devastated, right? This, this girl who's all loved and has a nice dress on, it wants to hit him. And she insists, no, I get to hit you. I want to really want to hit you. And so this boy is just like, he doesn't know what to do, but his feelings are hurt. I could just see that his feelings are hurt because she really wants to injure him. And then she gets frustrated with him because, don't move. I want to hit you. I want to hurt you. You can't move. You got to let me hurt you. And so that's, you know, the author, it seems to me that there's some racialist issues going on there. She can't get along with some of the Hispanic candidates, the Hispanic city council folks. biggest thing is that it's based on the Oakland model. So there was, you know, bit, some crimes. It seems like the crime is, they've been doing a good job on it, to be honest with you. There's been a lot less crime than what it seemed like there was about two years ago. But she's crying, you know, uh, to the hills about all the danger and is trying to make everything seem like it's the worst, this the worst town, the worst city, scaring the shit out of everybody, trying to use fear instead of people's hopes. And so the Oakland model, I can't think of another reason. Why would else would you pick the Oakland model? Why else? What about Oakland? The Raiders? You want the Raiders? You love the Raiders so much? What about Oakland? Did she see in Pueblo City that she says, you know what Pueblo City needs? An Oakland model. Not a Portugal or a uh, Portland model. Not a Happy Valley model. Not a restorative justice model. None of that. What she saw in Pueblo City, God, this, these damn gangsters are out of control. We need to target these young Hispanics like they do in Oakland. That's the premise, okay? Best case scenario, we're all singing Kumbaya. This thing is a wonderful thing. Gymnasiums are everywhere. We're all singing and we're all doing art pieces and we're sharing our artwork and it's a wonderful, happy place, right? 
that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that there's going to be a cleansing, an ethnic cleansing, that this is going to be targeting young Hispanic kids based upon how they dress, based upon who they are, their reputations, and based upon their skin color. This is going after young Hispanic kids, young Hispanic young adults, the ones who are, you know, the cops in the white male establishment, the 1% are most afraid of. And so they're going to target them. And are they going to just go after the violent thugs? Are they going to go after people just dressed a certain way? How are they going to determine who's at risk? How are they going to ter- determine who's the worst neighborhoods? And we're going to put more cops into the worst neighborhoods. While I think that the police are a force for good, 300 focuses them on Hispanic. percent black people in Pueblo City. There's 44 percent Hispanic, 56 or so white folks. So white folks are the majority. Hispanics come in a close second, and black people are nowhere to be found. Two percent. It's very. It's the national average of black folks in America is 17 percent. So Pueblo City, what the fuck did y'all do to the black folks? What did y'all do to your black folks? Was there some sort of massacre or genocide that I haven't read about yet that you know had happened here? That's what it feels like. There's some weird fucking, you know, eerie Indiana kind of feeling around here. 2% black folks, that's not enough. That's not enough. But it does tell me that there's old Hispanic men and women and old white men and women who are racist as shit. Just because that's what fucking old people are. That's what they do. But it's bullshit. It's dumb. Judge a person by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. So, best case scenario, we're all singing Kumbaya. A steward of American history. I know what happened to the uh, the Sand Creek Massacre. I know what happened to the Native Americans there. To what happened to Geronimo and to Pancho Villa. I know what happened in here in Pueblo. There was an El Pueblo Massacre in uh, 1854, 100 years before we got our charter. So there's a lot of things. There's a lot of history that had happened here. The Sand Creek Massacre was just, you know, pointless bloodshed. There was the Shogun Tunnel thing in Korea where they just, you know, 200 to 300 people, women and children were getting killed. You had the Ludlow Massacre where the corporations were the most important entity and to hell with the working class people and their families. And they killed a whole bunch of them. Ludlow is a ghost town today. And I know about Rosewood. I know about the massacre that happened in Rosewood. So are we all going to sing Kumbaya or is this just a white woman alleged rape? And now we're going to target all the Hispanics. Thank you. 